everyone. Welcome to the Life on Side B podcast, uh, Ministry of Posture Shift. I'm here today with Greg and Michelle, and we're going to talk about how they navigate being queer and their faith in non-ministry work environments. Welcome, y'all. Hello. Hello. I thought we would start out with an easier question. Um, so the first question is, what would you say is your favorite way to wind down, whether that be at the end of your day or at the end of a particularly stressful day, just like what is your favorite way to take time for yourself? Hmm. I know for me, the answer is probably one that makes me only like a little bit ashamed, but it is just endlessly <laughs> scrolling TikTok. <laughs> like, oh, it, is, Greg. <laughs> it is the bad fill in the blank. I mean, like I could say that like sometimes I go for a walk or like I catch up with my roommates or something like that. But like if I'm actually being honest, it is literally like today I clocked out of work immediately laid back on my bed and just watched TikTok for 20 minutes before eventually scrounging for dinner. Mm. So but right. it's honest and we're about honesty. So true, true. I mean, what brand of TikTok like, are you on? I'm on a lot of brands of TikTok. My TikTok, I, my algorithms are very confused. It is like <laughs> a com- solid combination of like classic gay TikTok meets cruise ship TikTok meets like airplane TikTok huh. meets what lately even I've does been that on like mean? small farm TikTok. Oh, interesting. So TikTok is like super siloed. And so like literally like if you download or save or like a single video about something random, it's now going to then start showing you those videos. And if you keep liking them or interacting with them, it's just going to show you more. So like you, I saved like one funny video about birds today. And then immediately I had like four more bird videos in my queue that I like otherwise had never encountered a bird video before. So it is it is very specific and niche but yeah i'm in my mind's very confused <laughs> but all right well my, i mean mine's not that much you know more honorable like binging netflix i guess like you just need the mindlessness at the end yeah. of the day um and i definitely gravitate towards either comedy or like Parks and Rec and The mm. Office, rewatching those, or um, some good sci-fi fantasy that really helps me escape. Yeah. So TikTok, Netflix, same thing. True. I think for me, it's casual social things or social things that don't involve me actually engaging. So like being on a call with someone and there's just silence as we both do our separate things. I feel like something about like being with another person helps me to actually decompress hmm. and TikTok. I really love TikTok. That algorithm does a lot. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's... I do my, my Instagram shows me like puppy reels a lot. Cause that's, that's what it's picked up for me. <laughs> so I get that. I'm, I'm not of the TikTok generation, I guess, but <laughs> Instagram I'm still there. There. There's something magical about it that's like the perfect combination of endless curiosity because like you can find people who just do the most random stuff and learn all kinds of things. And then at the same time, it's like kind of like a dose of thirst traps, a lot of funny, cute animals. True. And it's all never more than like three minutes. And yeah. usually it's like 30 seconds or less. And so it's just like perfect crack in my brain. Yep. I also think bad. because there are so many different brands of TikTok, I feel very represented in all aspects of myself, uh, yep. which sounds a lot deeper than I should be talking about social media. But it's nice to get like some random teacher content and then some music content and then just yeah. like the, the variety. I think I really appreciate. I'm always reminded oh. at how niche TikTok gets because there are all these like huge TikTok influencers who I literally have never seen their video before. Yep. Like I discovered Addison Ray today who apparently has like 80 million followers and like 4 billion likes. And I have never once seen a video of hers in my feed. Yep. And like TikTok knows me. It knows I don't care. Yeah. No, I feel that. I It's a thing that makes TikTok funny communally because I think there are things that everyone sees on their personal feed that they think everyone else is seeing. And then you mention it and no one has any idea what you're talking about. Correct. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, yeah, 
Uh, they they they've cracked it. Whatever they did, they Truly. figured that algorithm out, and that's that's yep. yeah. Um. So Michelle, um, I think this is the first time that you've been on the podcast. I'm so excited that you're here. I love hearing from you. Love the wisdom that you have to offer, and just like your life experience. Um, Thanks. So it, that, it was pretty. It's pretty cool that you were um, just at my house last week. Yeah, truly. That's pretty less fun. than a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you just like introduce yourself more generally? Talk about how you got to where you are in your journey with reconciling your faith and sexuality. Just like general yeah. background information that people need to know about you. Yep. So um, I am 39 years old. I just turned 39. It's kind of ew, but we're we're accepting it. Um, and I am a teacher, a public school teacher. Um, I'm an Enneagram four and a Ravenclaw, if anyone mm. cares. Um, I'm Italian. Um, I love the outdoors, photography, uh, and for the purposes of this conversation, I would identify as gay. Um, so I grew up in the church I grew up catholic actually um and i remember kind of knowing you know this this feeling of being attracted to to girls from very early on um you know even before puberty but um and grappling with it as with there's certain notches on my timeline that i remember that feel really significant like I remember talking to a priest about it when I was a teenager. Um, and then in, in college, I uh, my family um, evolved onto um, the Protestant Evangelical Church. And um, for the decade of my 20s, I would say I really internalized the sort of ex-gay mindset um, of believing that I would be healed. Um, and I, I mean, I actively pursued dating men. Um, I did not, I knew the word gay and homosexual, but I didn't think that that applied to me. Um, by the time I was 30, that, that all came crashing down. Like it just wasn't working. And I felt like I, um, I came to this realization that I could not move forward with my relationships in life um, without acknowledging this thing about me. And, um, and through Google, which is like, you know, the same sex attracted Christians tool. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just thinking it, I I'm 30 years old. I never met any other person in church like me. I've never heard it spoken about. Um, did not know one other person so of course I turned to Google and I think you know we've all been there where we're typing in that little search bar like uh I'm gay I think I'm gay and I'm also Christian like what do I do um and I found um West Hill Wash and Waiting I found a few bloggers uh Greg Webb being one of them Aww. And um, he apparently I, you know, I emailed him after reading his blog a few times and he thought that I was normal sounding. So he wrote back and we struck up a friendship. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, Greg and I have, have been buddies for a few years now. Um, <laughs> like a decade. True. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, we have at, for his birthday one year, I made him a collage of like the best selfies we've taken. And there were actually quite a few there's of them. A, there's a the few years. from Aww. like 2015 till now. Um, we, we take really cute selfies, Greg. Mm. We do. Yeah. Um, so anyway, and then through that, through some connections, I was invited to um, the you know, the online spaces that exist for side B. And um, I mean, I, I kind of, I guess, defaulted to side B. And I certainly knew that there were other views that existed. Um, but they never uh, resonated with me as possible. Um, I, I definitely find 
the philosophy and the theology of Psy B much more robust and um, convincing. And um, of course, emotionally, I've been, you know, attracted to affirming theology, but um, can't, can't quite get there intellectually. Um, mm. And over the years, I mean, I did struggle with my faith um, and felt, you know, experienced some deconstruction, felt disillusioned with a lot of things. Um, but over the years, just meeting more of these people, uh, went, went to retreats and conferences and developed a lot of friendships and saw that, you know, this is a, a very viable life that can be good and full. Um, always wanted to give God the benefit of the doubt mm. in it and and wait for him to to show me and i you know i feel like he has done that um so that's been the last dec decade has been you know building my my side b life and um it's kind of just where i am now and it makes sense to me dang uh, I really wish Dang. <laughs> I'm excited for this episode, but I have so many questions about your life and so many things that I would love to hear you talk about. Um, <laughs> thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, to shift a little bit more. It's hard, into... it's hard to, it's hard to sum up 20 years and yeah. like a quick. <laughs> yeah, you did it really well. Answer. I hope so. Um, to pivot a little bit into the topic of this episode we talked about this a little bit before we started recording but how would you all define vocational ministry i think for me it's so yeah like talking today particularly about those of us who, who are side b but don't find ourselves working in vocational ministry i think for me to define it, I typically think of like, where's your paycheck coming from? Like to just get really pragmatic, like, uh, is it a church? Is it a ministry organization? Is it a faith-based group? Uh, is there a statement of faith that you signed at some point kind of along the way? Uh, are you responsible to an HR department or are you responsible <laughs> to like a board of elders? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I yeah, it's, I think there, at least for the sake of our conversation today, maybe like what defines me and Michelle and our kind of uh, work compared to like maybe somebody who's like a pastor working in more formal vocational ministry. I mean, I do think there is kind of a wide variety of ways in which we all are doing ministry, that we all are following different vocations in that. Like my faith definitely plays a role in my non-faith-based work, but then also like, we may volunteer, we may do other things um, that are more ministry or vocational. Um, but I think for at least our conversation today, at least the way I'd, I would see it, it is really just as like that simple, like, where's your paycheck coming from? Like, what, who, what, what's the organization on your W-2? Are they uh, tax exempt? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it just describes a career in which someone is paid to work for a Christian organization. Um, and in a sense, your, your job depends on, you know, your, your beliefs. Um, I do, I think about people in our community who have struggled with some jobs because of that. Um, but basically, you know, it's just not a career in an in explicit Christian ministry. Hmm. If we want to say, like Greg said, all jobs are vocations, I think, to God. So that's a whole different conversation. But our paycheck's not coming from a church or doesn't depend on our beliefs. Yeah. So a lot of people feel that being side B is easier when you're in vocational ministry, especially if you're in vocational ministry specifically around sexuality and gender. Can the two of you talk to me a little bit about what your experience has been like that, been with that? Yeah. So for me to answer that, like, so for context, I, I did a, an undergrad degree in finance. I took a minor in philosophy. 
I, even by the end of college, I knew I wanted to do what uh, at the time I was planning to do counseling, a uh, mental health counseling, but from a Christian perspective. So to some extent, a form of ministry or potentially working in a ministry setting. Um, I did a three-year master's program for counseling and then found myself kind of like in the situation where like, my a job wasn't coming together, educate, like it wasn't quite working out. And so I ended up falling back on kind of some of my degree experience and my other job experience and, and found myself kind of working in financial tech or FinTech um, at first in a support role now and a higher level kind of like more compliance support role. And, and so for me, it, it, I've had the benefit of having the, the ability to kind of like work through my faith, my beliefs, how I feel about things, how I like interact with my sexuality, um, that it, that I, there's room for messiness and there's room for kind of like sorting through stuff where there isn't that anxiety of like my paycheck or like my rent is kind of dependent on where I end up in this conversation. Um, and I, I think so much of the time, I enjoy working <laughs> in environments where being gay or queer is like really not that special. Yeah. And I think <laughs> so often in, in our community in the side B world, there's so much kind of stress around that. Like, do I come out? Do I have this conversation? Like, and, and, and working at least for me in a very progressive kind of like tech finance, like, very Silicon Valley, San Francisco based kind of environment, literally nobody cares. Mm. Like, <laughs> like I still remember uh, one of my old jobs where like my manager was like a heterosexual married guy. And that was like the most like run the mill, nondescript, like nobody cared. And so even for me, like to differentiate myself as a side B person, um, I didn't get into too much of my personal life. And I didn't get into too much of my coworkers personalized for that matter and so um but also like it was fine being gay it was fine like if i talked about it it was okay but it, it also truly just didn't matter like mm -hmm. the work that i did the performance that i i made uh it wasn't dependent on what was my sexual ethic what were my beliefs uh where i was at in my spiritual life at any given moment and so i think for me that has offered a lot of kind of like relief and ability to kind of sort through the faith stuff outside of that. Very similar to Greg. Um, you know, I remember I, I had said before that I went through some seasons of, of doubt and deconstruction and even depression through that. Um, and I remember just grieving with a friend who was employed by a church at the time and was saying like, sometimes I want to take a break from church and I have done that um, at times and you know it's too painful um, and and he said I wish I could do that but he I mean that was his job to you know he was um, a youth pastor and so he recognized that those of us who are in not in vocational ministry um, there's definitely more breathing room um, during seasons of doubt and struggle and there's not a fear that you know I won't be accepted or employed if my views change um, I mean at my workplace I'll talk about this more later but I like Greg said it's it's not a big deal at all to be queer um, if anything, people are like, yeah, thumbs up. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's, it's a much more complicated when you get, when you're in um, a non-Christian affirming space to then get into your whole Christian identity. But we'll, we'll talk about that, I guess, in a bit. Um, Maybe I would also just add that um, for me, like it wasn't, I want to be careful because I, I'm not I'm not trying to say that I looked at kind of the Christian world and what I felt had been my calling to like do some form of ministry work. And I just decided like, oh, that would be too hard or that would be too strenuous. And so I'm just going to like take a different route as a way of like avoiding that. 
like for me, I very much found kind of like my secular vocational work as like, it just kind of came to be. And I realized I loved it and it kind of fit my mood and my brain and things that I love and got really excited about. And it just so happened that that put me in typically in kind of faith-based spaces. Um, and so I, I, I want to be careful because I, I don't want to say that like, I don't want to make it seem like I had, I felt like a really deep calling by God to pursue truly like vocational Christian ministry. And because it was going to be too hard for me as like a queer person or a gay person in that space, I decided to avoid it. Um, and so I, there is definitely, I, I do have friends who feel very much kind of foiled in their pursuit of like what they truly feel God's calling them to in vocational ministry because of their sexuality. And that has not been my experience. And so uh, I do want to kind of make space for that just because that is also a difficult experience where you feel really called to a pastoral life or ordained ministry in a denomination that may not be comfortable having a gay person who's ordained in that capacity. Um, and so I do think that is definitely like the struggle to, to vocational ministry in a Christian setting for a lot of queer folk um, is just how to, kind of how do you navigate that. Um, but for me, I just kind of got just lucky, I guess, <laughs> in the sense of like my my skill sets, my gifting kind of ended up naturally lining up in the career path that I have now. Um, and that I, I truly don't feel like I've like set aside or kind of given up on what once was my dream. This is where I've ended up is very naturally kind of been where I fit. Yeah, and like I was saying, um, all jobs are you know, we're living out our vocation regardless. Um, I, I can say some things I sometimes envy about people in ministry jobs is um, I think about my sister. She works for um, a large church organization and her work week consists of like prayer meetings, um, praying together as a staff, doing Bible studies together or reading mm -hmm. a book together. And it's, I think it's, um, it's cool that when that kind of spiritual formation and support is built into your job. Um, and in a way, like it gives you this natural accountability. Um, um, but yeah, then the, the drawback, I guess, is that there's less space maybe to doubt and struggle, but yeah. Would either of you say that you have specific challenges from not being in ministry? I definitely think so being fairly involved kind of in my church and in kind of like my broader Eastern Orthodox world. For me, there is always kind of a bit of that struggle that because I'm not in ordained ministry, I'm not in the Orthodox Church, I'm not like a priest, I don't have a, a MDiv. Uh, and so for me, anytime I'm speaking into these issues or speaking on this topic, I always feel like I'm maybe not quite as respected in those spaces just because I'm not, I don't mm -hmm. have like, diff, I don't have the right like reverend or father before my name. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are times where like, yeah, that, that feels like I would have more of a platform or more kind of respect in these conversations if I was in the more formal kind of ordained ministry. Um, it hasn't been maybe a big issue, but it is definitely something that I have experienced um, from time to time, um, just kind of in those environments, um, maybe not platformed in quite the same way as if you are like more naturally like, oh, you're an Orthodox priest. So of course you're qualified to speak on topics of sexuality because yeah. that's the thing. <laughs> what about you, Michelle? I think in this particular cultural moment, it can be challenging for any Christian to be, be like the Christian in um, their workplaces because I think that um, general attitudes towards religion are not very positive mm. right now. Um, and so also being like a queer person who is still aligned with traditional Christian theology, um, I find it 
more difficult and nerve wracking to come out as celibate <laughs> and Christian um, in my workspace, which is why I'm not really out to, I mean, to, I'm out to very few people at work. Um, it is not common knowledge and, you know, who knows what assumptions people make and, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm a 40 year old single woman, you know, so I'm sure people wonder, you know, why is she not married and who knows, but you're not 40 yet. <laughs> just about just accepting it. Um, you know, in a, so that's in a Christian context, when I tell my story, and explain where I'm at, I can draw from a shared language and a context that yeah, people at least like people have context for the things I'm saying and uh, where my convictions come from. Um, when I'm quote unquote out in the world, you know, I feel even more, it, it's weird because in a, in a workspace like that, being a gay person, you're, you're like automatically accepted. Like, like Greg said, it's not a big deal. Um, but then if you, you, when you, I find it challenging to explain the Christian and celibate part of it, because I'm always afraid that people, you know, will assume I'm repressed or see me as siding with, you know, an oppressive tradition. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just hard to explain. I mean, generally, I think people are respectful, at least on the surface. But, um, but I think it's it's difficult to explain, and which is why I have not gotten that in depth about my life with people at work. Much more comfortable with them knowing that I'm queer, but but also even then I feel like this Christian responsibility though, to like accurately witness my life to them so that mm -hmm. they can see where I'm at and just, and not make assumptions about me. Um, Cause obviously I, if I'm, if I'm going to share the queer part of me, I want to also share the Jesus part and yeah. let people see how those things um, integrate together. Um, but I think a challenge in my non-ministry work space is being a minority that, um, wait, we might edit that last part because I don't know how I'm finishing that sentence. <laughs> okay. That's I, fair. Do you, you know what I'm saying, I, Greg? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I got you. So I'll Greg be, just... I, Greg, I feel like you're more, you're out at work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and does everybody pretty much know where you stand with your theology honestly, or, or you don't even go there? Honestly, for the most part, I don't, we, I haven't gone there. Um, and that's probably a diff, couple of different reasons, some of which you kind of named. Um, and like, and, and to be clear, I think, I think as a single person, it is, there are fewer kind of external markers that differentiate your kind of like a sexual orientation, particularly in an environment where like people don't necessarily assume that you're straight. And so like in the church, there definitely feels like this need to differentiate like, oh, I'm queer versus I'm just like a single person. Because if I'm just a single person and in my <laughs> mid thirties in the church, everybody's going to be like trying to connect me with like their daughters. like. <laughs> It's been a little bit of my experience in the past and it's like, okay, like I have to like give some flag or some indication that like that's a pointless endeavor. Um, but, and so I think for me, like to be clear, like in my workspace, like I, I in, in my current job, I have two coworkers who are also queer, at least two coworkers, I should clarify, two that I know for sure. Um, and the only reason sexual, uh, sexual orientation has come up is just in the context of like their partnerships or their ex partnerships. And so like one of my coworkers for the first couple of months only referred to her partner that she was moving to be with as her partner. And it wasn't until like offhandedly one day that she mentioned the gender of her partner. 
Uh, and the same went for another one of my coworkers. Like I didn't necessarily know they were queer until they mentioned something about that. And so I think for me, as somebody who's not partnered, it, there has been that less specific reasons for me to necessarily have to like bring it up specifically. Um, in my last job, I worked there for four and a half years. I had a couple of coworkers I worked with for like all of that time. And I was definitely out to them, but it was never like an outing. Like there was mm-hmm. never like a formal, like I sent everybody like a DM on Slack, like, <laughs> Hey, just so you know, like, because you just don't do that because that's kind of odd, but like, that is absolutely a church, like in a, a kind of Christian world thing where that has to be a conversation, uh, where like I wear a pride Apple watch wristband. Uh, it's the only rainbow thing I have for the record. <laughs> but for me, it was just like a helpful way to just kind of like have that indicator without there necessarily having to be like a lengthy conversation. Um, but like, yeah, I'm not, I'm definitely not closeted. Like, um, and like at my last job, like it would come up because like you would like talk about like a, customer that you were assisting who you found very like attractive for whatever reason or whatever and so like occasionally like the genders of the people you're really drawn to eventually kind of comes out uh but yeah it's just not that explicit but also like we're also not having faith conversations uh yeah. that are that explicit like i don't know the religious backgrounds of my coworkers. um i don't know what they do on sunday mornings i might assume things but that would often be uneducated um and so i do to some extent like there's lots of different parts of yourself that you are called to bring to like a progressive secular work environment and your sex like your your sexual identity is kind of one of those but then we all still very much code switch when we're Mm -hmm. in an office environment or a work environment and so none of us are really like our full selves when we're at work um i mean Michelle, you work with a bunch of teenagers. Like, I'm sure there are ways in which you interact with like your friends outside of work that are absolutely not the same way you interact with your students. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the same for me in kind of a work setting. Um, but it also doesn't feel like I, it's something I have to avoid. Like I'm not closeted. Like I'm not actively like trying to avoid things that might indicate that. Um, so yeah, like, I do think there is a ch- challenge and maybe there is more room for me to integrate more of that faith aspect of my experience. Um, I tend to be kind of somewhat of an introverted, like individual contributor in a work environment. So like, I'm not like involved in all the organizations and all the other stuff that maybe like, if we had like a faith CRG like, employee group that I would maybe be involved with, I don't know. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't mind kind of the dynamic we have at the moment. Um, but I, I do have friends who, who are in very progressive secular environments who, because of the nature of just how progressive or secular kind of their work environment is, they can't be out because if they were out at all, then they'd have to be out about the fact that they were not dating and about why that would be. And then they might be seen mm. as like a bigot or um, that would be brought into question. And so, like, for me, like, if one of my coworkers saw one of the recordings of me talking at, like, Revoice or, like, read a blog post that I'd written at some point over the years, like, I'd be a little mortified in the same way that if, like, one of my, like, great aunts saw it as well. Like, like, it's not, like, the end of the world, but it's just, like, a conversation with somebody that I don't need to have that kind of conversation with at that level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Yeah, I think, I mean. Greg, I feel the same as you, like, I'm not, you know, in the closet anymore in my general life. I think at a place like work, we all do make deliberate decisions about how much of ourselves we open and reveal to people. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but I find that generally people also don't like dig and it's just Mm -hmm. kind of this, you know, like, but what I struggle with in getting to know new friends um, and coworkers is, you know, there's, it remains surfacey to a point and there's always, you know, there's topics that come up like dating, family, marriage. Um, mm-hmm. So I always have to think about how much do I want to say um, yeah. or do I want to avoid those topics altogether so that I don't mm-hmm. have to. Um, 
I'm thinking of, you know, there's this um, new, there's this new teacher at work and he's a really nice guy. He has a, he has a male partner. Um, we have like a fun banter between us and, you know, I worry if down the line, if he finds out that I'm like a Christian person who doesn't believe in same-sex relationships you know is he gonna feel like i did a bait and switch like <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm super nice to him of course this all might be in my imagination um i might be inflating these fears and i do want to i feel like i've moved towards being more open because i'm over the years i felt more confident and secure in my own path so that I don't feel the need to like um, defend and explain it. I'm just, you know, gonna live my life and let people observe it. Um, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking, speaking of being mortified, so I'm out to precisely two people at work. One is a friend I've known for a really long time. Um, we knew each other before we, we worked together. The other one is a relatively new friend and we were rock climbing buddies. We started to go rock climbing together after work. Um, didn't know him very well. And as it sometimes does, the topic of dating came up in our small talk and I just blurted out, I don't know what came over me. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, actually, you know, I don't date. I'm attracted to women, but I don't pursue that for religious reasons. And then he was like, what the heck? <laughs> that's, that's bold. So then I just spent the rest of the rock climbing session trying to casually explain it confidently, like, um, while also trying to affirm that, like, Yes, I understand that religion has been oppressive and has treated, you know, LGBT people poorly historically. Um, and you're also down with the gays. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're trying to show both at the same time. <laughs> yep. Um, but uh, no, I spent the rest You've of the night. You've been to Pride in Chicago. I have. We have. Um, I've also been stuck uh -huh. at the Chicago airport several times visiting you. Um, Mm -hmm. Anyway, I spent the rest of the night like panicking because I'm like, I don't even know this person. And now I'm like, mm -hmm. are they going to tell other people at work? Like, why did I do that? Um, but actually, it turns out that, I mean, he he's a really nice guy. He's He's like totally, he's an atheist, you know, doesn't buy into it at all. But he's pretty respectful and... He thinks I'm crazy, um, but he has kept it a secret, you know, mm -hmm. and it, he, he's like, he's like a good buddy at work now. Mm -hmm. And is that a um, conversation? I probably like my, my existence is probably such a conundrum to him, I think. So maybe it's making him think, you know, um, but still, he, so he knows my views, but sometimes if I'll, post on my Instagram story, like hanging out with a, a friend, a female friend, he always comments like, is this your girlfriend? Is this your girlfriend? And I'm like, no. That's weird. It, but so I have found that with several people that when I explain my views and that I'm celibate, they still ask me from time to time how my love life is. If I've met someone, am I dating? And it's like, people don't believe us. Because yeah. they think it's crazy. And they just yeah. are like, oh, well, you just haven't met the right person yet. So and my dad's very sweet cousins will pull me aside at family gatherings and be like, so are, are you still doing the, 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 the celibacy? <laughs> I was like, Deb, the, the celibacy thing? Yes, I am still doing it. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, and literally this has happened two or three times now over the years. <laughs> it's just like, I'm okay. I know. it. They're, they want you to be happy, like that's what he says, and because that's how they yeah. what they imagine for it. You know, it's lighthearted and funny, so I think that this is like a unique friendship now I have at work. So I'm yeah. glad I did mm -hmm. it, but 
Yeah. Um, I guess you have to choose the right people. Sometimes you blurt it out by accident yeah. and then just deal with <laughs> however it goes. Yeah. Um, but I hope, you know, I don't like staying on the surface with people. So, you know, I am praying this year that in in times where it makes sense, you know, it's kind of like, sure. Greg, what you said, I, I don't care if people really know that I'm queer. It's just that there's a lot to explain with that yeah. to get yeah. for yeah. people to get a true sense of where I'm at. And I think that is hard to navigate in the um, secular space. Especially if the people you're interacting with are the type that would like want to ask follow up questions. Yeah. <laughs> but also like I I deliberately don't think I was friends on social media with any of my former coworkers until like I left my last job. And then I like selectively followed and friended a few of them. Mm -hmm. But it was like a very deliberate like and at my current job, like I don't follow any of my coworkers on social media, none of them follow me on social media. And I am quite happy with that that they're all lovely delightful people who i enjoy um but also like part of my job is it like we were all hired since covid started we are all working remotely some of us don't even live in the same cities and so our interactions we don't have like a ton of space for a lot of the kind of like casual side conversations outside of chit chats about like portillo's or like where we're getting lunch on a given day or something like that. So, so that it would be different in an office environment where you might like, like who you bring to like the Christmas party and things like that may, yeah. may beg more questions. Um, but I've so far been, been, it's been pretty chill for me in my experience. So I've had a lot of the benefits without thankfully a lot of the kind of those kind of more awkward moments or conversations, but those are definitely kind of the, the, the take on the give and take quiet side yeah the tension i feel all the time is i want to be known mm -hmm. um i i don't like being on the surface but to be known just re requires a lot more um, explanation for things that people may not necessarily understand yeah and yeah. i feel that you know i feel the pressure of like I said before, okay, if I'm going to re reveal this queer part of me, um, I also want to reveal the Christian part of me so that there's like a testimony and a witness there. Um, someone once told me like, don't put that pressure on yourself. Um, just let your life speak for itself. And, but I wonder like my school has a, um, a, a gay straight alliance club i don't think that's what it's called something like that you know and i wonder would would it ever make sense for me to like you know support that as a staff member or do i just want to stay back from that mm -hmm. i don't know sure. and i i'm definitely would be accepted as a queer person but would i be accepted as a christian with um you know, conservative theology in it. So that, those are yeah. things that I, those are tensions I feel at work for sure. Absolutely. I have follow-up questions for both of you. Uh, we'll start with Michelle. Um, how do you navigate the conversations when people are asking about family, dating, relationships, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I just think that would be something that's helpful for someone in a similar situation of like what language you use, where do you redirect the conversation, that kind of energy. Okay. So I'm trying to think of ways. So it actually has not come up a lot because I guess I avoid the way you can avoid it is you don't ask that person about those things because mm -hmm. then they turn around and just, you know, say, how about you? So, um, 
a lot of my coworkers are already married. So like talking about their family is more obvious. Um, mm. If so, let's think of in hypotheticals. If it was somebody who just asked me about dating and I didn't want to be out to them, I might just try to shrug it off and say, not right now, mm. you know, or um, focusing on other things like, you know, and, and that's like, if, if that's not someone I wanted care to go into a deeper relationship with. So shrug off the conversation, give a pat answer and move on. Yeah. Um, if it's someone I plan to be better friends with, at this point in my life, I would probably be like, well, and give an answer similar to you with my rock climbing friend and just, you know, or maybe prep them like, well, that's an interesting answer. Um, you know, this is kind of where I'm at in life. Don't really, I don't really date. Yeah. Um, so I think it depends on where you intend to go with the person who's asking. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not super good at lying because you, like I, I just blurt out things how they are. Um, so it does take some mental calculation to, to give that more generic answer. Um, yeah. But I think that that's safer and better for you if you're not ready and you don't want to take that work relationship to a more friendship level. So that's perfectly fine, I think. For sure, for sure. Where you don't want to take that relationship to the next level. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah, very good, Greg. Um, yeah. The Just tension to... of like wanting to be known and seen in depth, but also are these conversations appropriate for work? A work context is so real, and it's interesting to hear how both of you have navigated that. Um, for you, Greg, would you say that there are times in your workplace where you felt like you should talk about being side B, or like has that conversation come up with people? Have there been spaces where you felt like it was relevant, and how have you engaged those moments? Yeah, so far, no, not explicitly. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it is kind of unique. So in, in my last job, I did have the the blessing, so to speak, of working uh, with three of my close friends who I was friends with outside of work already and who are very much connected to like the holy gay Christian conversation. And so as far as like, so they already knew. And so I wasn't looking to work friends to like be like, to have those conversations with per se. And then in my current position, I've been with my current company since March. And we like, again, I literally have met most of my coworkers once in person when my boss was visiting town randomly. But otherwise our relationship is entirely like over Zoom and, and the work we do. And so it just doesn't feel like there's been a lot of context for that. Um, I think general, generally for me, when it, when it does come up, like I, I can be open about my faith like, and so I will talk about the fact that, like, I am Orthodox uh, or Eastern Orthodox or, like, I know a lot of Greek people if, if the occasion, like, if that makes sense in a given context. Um, and so if, if there was to be a conversation, if somebody was to ask me about, like, my love life, so to speak, uh, I think for me, I would simply say, like, yeah, I'm single and I'm single right now. And at the moment, like, I'm not uh, dating uh, and that's how I've navigated congruency with my Orthodox faith. Uh, I have a lot of gay friends who make very different decisions than I do in that regards. And so like, um, but at least for me and the choice I'm making, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not currently dating. I'm not currently in a relationship. Um, but also like most of my coworkers aren't either. Like a lot of my single coworkers, like, I don't know if they're on Hinge. I don't know if they're on Grindr. I don't know like what, like how many dates they're going on over a weekend. Like, and so those are just like, I don't know. And it is interesting how different environments kind of navigate this because 
like i remember we had like a a sensitivity training with an attorney from like outside counsel and they were even like we recommend that you always have like a virtual zoom background just because like just to keep the work life that separate in a way and it was like okay that's like okay like just like in case because you never know like what in your space what in the camera might like offend somebody or like my like share something about like your political belief or like something else like mm-hmm. that um so yeah i that was I'm maybe somewhere in between like I, like uh how that goes mm-hmm. but yeah it, it's definitely i think i generally would avoid it if somebody really did want to have like a genuine conversation about it i think i would treat it like a genuine conversation and like I'm happy to be more open about it. I just have not had that relationally with my coworkers and I have a lot of relationships outside of work. And so I haven't felt the need to, to necessarily try to pursue that in my work setting, but that's not necessarily a universal thing. I I feel it's sort of a, a pride slash shame thing. Like, um, Greg, you said that this, this job you're in now, you only know each other virtually. I'm, I'm thinking Mm -hmm. back to, I was at a previous teaching job for eight years. Um, and every year we had the, the administration would throw a holiday banquet for the staff. And, um, so for eight years, year after year, I, I saw my coworkers lives evolve. You know, whereas year one, they're, they're single like me. And then another year they're bringing the boyfriend or girlfriend. Then it's the fiance that becomes a spouse. Mm -hmm. Then they're like, oh, we had to hire a baby. So being at the same workplace for eight years with this tight knit family, um, it, it gnawed at me to not be like, and I think it's a cultural pressure too like I feel like there has to be a legit explanation for why I'm just single and my life just does not change while I've watched my coworkers lives evolve over these eight years and it every and every like- every Christmas banquet it's just me I show up by myself um they need you to know, give you a I, plus one they that I could have but who you know who would I who would I take and then I'd have to be like, no, this is, we're just friends. We're just friends, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think that there's a little like pride and vanity in that, that maybe is not necessary. Um, mm-hmm. In that job, I was out. I, I think like you need, if you're not gonna be out to everybody, you need a couple really trusted friends and mm-hmm. that makes you feel more grounded. So mm-hmm. at that job, sure. There were a few people um, that knew my situation. And at this job now, there's a couple people, you know, so at least like yeah. you have a sort of anchor where you feel like, well, there's a few people who really know me here and, that, yeah. and that's yeah. enough. Um, but I, and- I really, I have been thinking a lot more about how to have those conversations um, if I want to share more of myself with friends at work, if I want to go deeper, because I just, I, I love having authentic relationships. Um, I find it difficult to stay on the surface with people. Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about it um, all summer and just, I think, um, and Sarah, I know one of your questions would be about this, like how to navigate affirming spaces <laughs> at work. I'm gonna assume pretty much most everybody's affirming of um, LGBT mm-hmm. identities. Um, and I hope to, I think, I think about that verse that tells us to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. So Mm -hmm. I've been feeling um, that maybe more in the background that I need to think about how different ways I can articulate my beliefs to different people in 
with language that would make sense to them um, and in a way that shows a confidence and a grace in, in how I'm living. So I think I want to do more work on my end privately to, to really develop my language um, for speaking to friends in who are not Christian and how, how I would explain this. Um, and I think in those spaces too, it's important to affirm their concerns and their objections, like mm -hmm. to maybe your religious tradition and your beliefs, um, you know, to say like, no, I totally understand why, why you think that, um, I agree with you on this and this, and then to be able to clarify um, how how you see certain things differently and why, you know, but but um, just be like, no, but I totally understand how someone could arrive at a different conclusion. So I think in, in navigating those conversations, affirming the other viewpoint and just showing understanding um, would help a lot. Yeah. But we need to be prepared to give a reason, right, for the this crazy life that we're living. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about you, Greg? We talked, I think you talked a little bit earlier about not being in like particular non-Christian affirming spaces at work, but I know that you navigate them outside of work and how, like, how have you balanced that? Yeah, um, not always maybe in a way that I would say like, this is the example, this is how to do it. Um, yeah, I think over, over the years, like, I don't know, I, I've been, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of good friends. And so I have a lot of like those people that I can share life, do life with that are not necessarily like, so I'm not looking to my workspace to provide that necessarily. Yeah. And so I don't need, like, I have a lot of coworkers who like, their coworkers are a lot of their primary people. Mm -hmm. Like that's who like they're hanging out with on a weekend, their roommates, things like that. And that's just never been something that I've looked to for that. Um, and so because of that, I think there is an aspect for me where I've been a lot more comfortable just kind of keeping things a bit more shallow. In, yeah. Um, yeah, like how I've navigated those like affirming spaces. Like I, I lurk. <laughs> And my current company is kind of like queer space. <laughs> like I'm in the Slack group, but like I don't really actively participate in it. Mm -hmm. But also I just, I don't typically join in any of like kind of the work social hangout stuff like outside of my immediate team, just because it's just, I, I, yeah. Um, and so that's not necessarily related to my sexuality or my faith per se it's just kind of me my personality yep. um i think of as i've navigated like affirming spaces outside of like a work environment i mean so much of it for me is just kind of like this is who i am these are the choices that i'm making uh, at the end of the day do i believe that like this or god's calling me and do i believe that this is like ultimately like god's truth and his purpose and, and his intention for us yes um but also like there's so many steps in that process there are so many things that like influence and have played into that for me that i can't like immediately assume that or place that upon everybody else that i'm interacting with on a daily basis um and so for like yeah it is in some environment simply saying that yeah i'm not currently dating is sufficient hmm. like I don't need to tell them it's because I'm still getting over heartbreak from like two years. Like I don't need, like there doesn't need to be like a saga or a story in the same way if a coworker mentioned that they weren't planning to have kids and be like, why, why, why aren't you going to have kids? Like, um, yeah, generally so, people don't, yeah. don't dig like that. They're just like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and if you yeah. want to develop more of a friendship, then, then you lead the conversation sure. that way. But, Otherwise, at work, you know, people tend to be surfacey. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, I don't know if that was really a complete answer to your question, Sarah, but. Also, I interrupted yeah. you, sorry. It's okay, I don't, <laughs> I didn't have another half, so you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg, something I wanted to ask you specifically, um, I know that some people would say that even though you're not receiving a paycheck, you are in a position of leadership inside these spaces. And so how would you say that your situation is similar or different from people who are full-time employed in ministry, um, particularly within side B spaces? Yeah, for me, um, it's, I, I can, I can support and help in those ways out of an, an excess or an abundance of kind of like time and energy um where i can feel like this is the way that i'm doing ministry this is the way that i'm like living out like my fa faith or vocation by like helping to care for side b spaces or speak inside b environments about my experiences um where it's not been kind of like it's not my day job and so because of that i have maybe more bandwidth to do it kind of on the side um there's less also pressure um i also um, over the years, like I, I am able to maybe more financially support organizations and causes that I believe in. Um, and so in that way I can support ministry while not necessarily contributing to it in like my own efforts, my own energy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is just that option. I do feel like I'm called to it mm -hmm. in that way. Like I do have a master's degree in counseling. There are definitely ways like I can help and support using the skills and giftings that I have. Uh, but it's also not like my money maker. It's not, yeah, at the end of the day, like my, where my W2 is coming from. Although sometimes my 1099. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have really enjoyed talking to both of you. Um, I think one of my biggest takeaways from this conversation is just the ways um, the importance of having balance in relationship and that just because you're not out doesn't necessarily mean that you are being an authentic, but that you, there are so many different ways to navigate those relationships to your coworkers, navigate with friends, um, and just a release, I think, from the pressure that people feel. And I hope our listeners get that to be out or to be out in a certain way or to be out um, and have to have these really deep, intense conversations with people within their work environment. Um, so I really appreciate you all sharing all of that. I did want to ask, do you have any final takeaways, anything um, you want to make sure our listeners hear and remember? Or any topic that you wish I had asked about, but I did not. Well, I would affirm that um, being out is best in trusted relationships. Um, I mean, some people in our circles feel called to be like, public figures in a sense in this mm -hmm. this like side b public figures and then you know we see the 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 controversy um that they attract online you know with um people commenting and and things and we don't all have to be called to that <laughs> so um for me at work you know I, i'm not trying to like create an identity or take a stand um being out for me is because I want to have deeper relationships. And, and in that, like, of course, I hope that, that my story with Jesus, like impacts somebody's life and that they see me living out my convictions that that has um, an impact, but it's more about relationships for me than about taking any kind of stand. I think I would just say that I, so just keep in mind that like every space is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Like my experience is not going to be everybody's experience. Um, I have worked in two fairly progressive tech companies, both like I worked at a company for four and a half years that had like a hundred out of a hundred on the human rights campaigns, like safe space to work kind of. And so like, that's very different than a, a engineering job in the south like those are not going to overlap like um i have my lot one of like most of my co workspaces are probably at least like a third queer that's not a statistical norm <laughs> and so just because i'm working in a non-ministry environment does not mean every non-ministry environment 
is going to be a safe space, either to be out of side B or even out in general. Yeah. Like there is still a lot of discrimination that has and can take place in all over the country. Um, one of my first jobs, I remember I worked at a bank and it was very conservative, very old school, very traditional. And I was legitimately, I was concerned about like being out in that environment. Um, I later learned that it would have been okay. It wasn't a big deal, but like, just, it was a different environment than yeah. when you're working for a Silicon Valley, San Francisco based company that like, <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of like trust your gut, trust if you kind of trust people around you to like know how maybe like best to bring what parts of yourself into what spaces. Um, nobody, nobody deserves or, or nobody has a right mm -hmm. to know all of your personal details about your life. That is something that you can offer or give to other people uh, as you feel called or safe to do so. But that is not something at all that you have to disclose or have to share, no matter like what space you're in, um, but especially not in a work like more secular environment. Um, so yeah, so just because I, I don't want the takeaway to be that like, if you're having a struggle in a ministry environment, you need to quit your ministry job and go get a job at like McDonald's because that's that's not gonna be the same thing. Although maybe Starbucks, like historically <laughs> super queer affirming space. Uh, but yeah, it's everybody's experience is gonna be different and then they just kind of like trust your judgment and also like nobody ha has a right to know that beyond what you decide to disclose or share. Well, this has been a lovely conversation. Thank you, Greg and Michelle, so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I, yeah, I really enjoyed hearing from both of you. So we will see you all next time. Thanks for awesome. having us. Thanks for having us there. Good to see you, friends. Bye.